<laughs> are you sure? Okay, there we are. Positive. Yes. We are now live. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> We're Welcome. <learning. laughs> Welcome to the Light Gate. Hello, Just to everyone. let you know, we are broadcasting to you from New Orleans at uh, UPRN and uh, United Paranormal Radio Na Network, uh, 107.7 FM and 105.3 FM. We are on Roku, we're on YouTube, Facebook, and a couple others. Roku cannot uh, be in chat with us, I'm sorry to say, but we will describe everything, especially if we put up a film of things, we'll describe it as well as we can for our radio audience, because we love y'all. And uh, we go, Preston. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I'm pretty excited. I think we've got a really cool show tonight. My name is Preston Dennett, as I'm sure you all know, but for those who don't know me, I've been a researcher since 1986, thereabouts. And my lovely co-host is Dolly Safran. She is an experiencer, a fully conscious experiencer in the subject of my book, Symmetry. So yeah, we're very excited to be doing The Light Gate. And our guest is a really exciting guest. This is episode number eight. And our guest is Albert Rosales. I've been wanting to get him on the show from the beginning. He's someone who I really respect as a researcher. He's a researcher, he's an author, he's an experiencer, and he's had a huge influence on this field. Let me just read his bio here. Albert Rosales was born in Cuba, actually, where he experienced several strange events, both paranormal and UFO related, including very close up sightings, and perhaps missing time, we'll talk about that. But he migrated to Spain in 1966, lived there for a year, and then moved to the US in 1967. He joined the US Navy in 1976 after traveling to Europe. Wow, he's had an interesting life. It was there that he began collecting reports on UFOs and other strange encounters. In 1980, he went to work for his father until he became ill and passed away. Albert then joined the Miami-Dade Police Department as a 911 dispatcher in 1984 and worked there for 35 years. He heard all kinds of stories there, including things involving UFOs and humanoids. I can't wait to hear about that. In the early 1990s, Albert began to concentrate on summarizing only humanoid entity encounters of all kinds. And to date, 2022, he has summarized and collected over, wait for it, this is amazing, collected over 24,000 reports. His database is updated and corrected daily. Albert has written 16 books on chronologies of entity and humanoid encounters. These are the series of books is called Humanoid Encounters, and it's truly a vital research tool for anyone interested in this phenomenon, researcher or experiencer. And he's also written a book about UFOs and humanoids over Florida, which is called UFOs over Florida. It's absolutely the most comprehensive book of cases in that state. So these can be obtained, of course, both in print and Kindle versions on Amazon. Uh, Albert started publishing his books around 2015 and is currently working on his latest volume of Humanoid Encounters, which is from 2016 through 2021. His 15 volume set is chronological and starts over a hundred years ago. So I don't know that there's anyone out there who has studied humanoid reports more than our guest tonight. He's absolutely one of the leading experts on humanoid encounters and actually does run an excellent Facebook page on humanoids. It's called Humanoids, UFOs, and Other Strange Phenomena, which has thousands of members and is growing fast. He has been a guest on numerous podcasts such as Arcane Radio, Phantoms and Monsters, Coast to Coast, and many others. And today he is our guest on The Light Gate. So I will just bring him in right now. There he is. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm really happy. I'm excited. Uh, Preston, I'm, yeah. I, I've been uh, one of Preston's fans for years. I 
my goodness. I got most of his books. Like this one, my favorite one. I was telling him about <laughs> UFOs over California. So this is a good book. I recommend it. A lot of awesome. a lot of cases there. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Well, I can say the same about you. I have every single volume of Humanoid Encounters. I couldn't live without them. I mean, I know that you've been working on them forever. And they're, I, uh, they're <laughs> I'm I'm working on my next volume, but I, is, I'm, there's been some issues with the publishing company and stuff, so I'm in a hole there. And I'm working on on building up a um, either a blog spot or a website where I want to share all my uh, my database, which is close to thirty thousand right now. It's uh, a lot. Not amazing. And uh, hey, thanks to people like you that collect, you know, that study these things and and investigate them and share them because what is it what good is it to investigate a ufo report and then keep it all to yourself and then i you know exchange with other researchers that's 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 one of my pet peeves if exactly. you want to share yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i don't know how many researchers i've talked to who are great researchers but sit on all their cases and then there's they do. They do. who are perhaps not <laughs> as good at researching and are putting out stuff that are a little questionable. Well, <laughs> half, of, half of the stuff I see on YouTube, or more than half, maybe those, but you know how it is. I don't. <laughs> yeah, it's successful. I mean, let's just face it. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, we're, we're being bombarded with uh, this information and all this BS, and the good stuff is like left aside, and most people ignore that. Yeah, well, well, that's what I love about your research, Albert, because you're not overlaying any belief systems or trying to interpret it or doing any what I call you know, shoe fitting and cherry picking. You're the kind of researcher I really like. Who just tells it like it is, facts only. This is what happened. This is what the people saw. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. And uh, I think, and, and I think, yeah, I think it's important to share anybody out there that has an, an experience like Dolly. Share it. Tell people about it. I think it's important that Something. that's that's done. Yeah, because most people do keep silent. <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> nowadays, is more. I think people are more open to that. Yeah. To what's going on. One of the reasons I'm absolutely excited that you're in the room with us tonight is you've lived in Miami and um, you know Miami well. And yes. uh, I know that you're probably have you you're an experiencer as well of sorts, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I also know that. that. <laughs> yeah, I also know that you worked at the Miami Dade Metro Center as a dispatcher or a nine one one taker, right? Yeah, Miami Dade Police as a dispatcher, yeah. thirty five years. My I father heard it was. All. Of, yeah. My father was one of the principal architects that designed that center that you're in. You were in. I'm not is, kidding. You. Is that the one on Miller, Fifty uh, Sixth Street? And I think so. It's the big glassy one, you know. With yeah. the yeah, that's it. Yep. Now we they when I. I retired in 2019. Uh, yeah. They have moved to another another site in Doral. Oh my bigger. gosh! It's called Lightspeed. Wow. It's a See, huge building. Life changes yeah. on a dime. It really does. Yeah. What's new today is old tomorrow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm dying to know what what got you into doing this. I mean, what prompted you? What put you on the path? I don't know. It's kind <laughs> of like like Preston said, I when I was a, a kid back in Cuba and back in the day in the 60s, uh, I had several experiences which back then I didn't know what I was dealing with. I I remember one night um, sitting out front with my family in front of the house. There used to be a lot of like power outages back then. There still are probably. Yeah. I was sitting out front with my family. Uh, they were playing dominoes with neighbors and drinking coffee. And I looked up, and there was this object across, hovering across the street over a, a house. And they all looked at it. They all became a little excited. And they, then they go up. Oh, it's probably the Americans because, <laughs> well, that's that's all the talk that was back then. You know, Bay of Pigs missile crisis, right. and everybody everybody thought that the Americans were here already. There, but the the object didn't move. It was standing still there and hovered. It looked like a bell, but is it was surrounded with light so it moved and i was the only one in, out of the group that was really curious Ooh, what is mm -hmm. that and i followed it i walked under the uh, behind the object and it stopped uh, in a <clears throat> over a field behind my house where i lived mm -hmm. and i just stood under it for i had no idea how high it was but i don't think it was that high 
I stood under for a while. And then next thing I remember was my mom calling my name. Where have I been? And why are you so wet? I was, it hadn't rained. I was wet for some reason. Oh my God. And um, <clears throat> I don't recall how much time it passed. I don't think my mom told me, but I was gone. I've been missing for a little bit, I guess. Nobody knew where I was. Okay. I never, I never been regressed, hypnotically regressed, but I'm sure there was some kind of missing time involved there. And and back then I didn't know what a UFO was. Yeah, that's what I was going to Later ask. on, yeah, <laughs> later on I, I started what, remembering what? all these incidents that I had as a, as a child that they I put put two and two together. I go, wait a minute, what was that? You know. Well, after that incident, did you have any dreams or anything? Yeah. Indicating? I had I had a dream which is one of those dream, dreams that you don't know if it's real or not. It's kind of uh, lucid. I was right. sitting in the kitchen table. This is still back in Cuba in the same house. And there were some figures sitting around me. And they were, to me, I, they were luminous. I couldn't see their, their, uh, they were human shaped, but they were like bright in, or in color, like luminous. I couldn't see any details. And they were talking to me about something that to this day, I don't remember what. And it was something important that I was supposed to remember. Hopefully I did <laughs> in the future. I remember <laughs> what it was, but that's one of the dreams I had. Plus I had other, and that little, um, send you a little file on that, but I had other encounters. There was one probably has to do with paranormal in the same house. I was uh, maybe six years old. I was walking through the hallway. There was a mirror. And I looked up and there was a face in the mirror looking down at me. And I this is one thing that I remember I remember to this day. It looked like a bearded black beard. To me, it was like a Spaniard. He had one right. of those helmets, black beard, and oh, he was like yeah. smiling. He's like oh, laughing wow. at me. And I look, it didn't say a word, I, nothing was spoken that I remember. And I looked at it, and I, I became afraid. I ran, I got my mom, they came back and of course he was gone but that's one one uh one of the memories that i clearly remember after that i was i was afraid of the dark to sleep in the dark by myself it was terrible mm -hmm. for a while yeah no no when you saw that thing in the mirror did you feel like it was aware of you because it was it was looking down at me i was <laughs> a little shorter and he was like looking down and he was he had a big grin not a smile like a grin yeah, they had that black mustache with a beard, and it looked like a, one of those helmets, the Spanish shoes back, conquistador type. Yeah, conquistador. And in Cuba, they, they were there <laughs> in, that, in the, that area there. I know they were there, but I, what I saw, I have no idea. I, I don't have I don't have any answers. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you know? do you think it was spirit related? You know, like a ghostly thing, or I think so. I think it was some kind of energy, spiritual energy, or something. Uh, that's now, what it know, like. I think there's there's a lot of connections with uh, different type of paranormal things, you know, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of paranormal activity involving UFOs too. I believe. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. wow. You said you had another um, missing time. Let me see. You sent me something. One summer in the beach. Here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was I was at a beach. This is kind of weird because it was on an old place they had an old pier that was falling apart nobody walked to the pier it was like you walk there's a couple of boards and there were five missing and mm -hmm. in order to get to the end you had to like you know nobody went out there it was kind of dangerous anyway i was done in the i went out by myself i didn't go to the pier i was on walking through the dunes it was kind of isolated back then that area and there was you know the crabs how they have holes in the ground yeah. And I, I was looking, all of a sudden there were a bunch of holes all over the place and there were crabs coming out. But these crabs looked looked like they were giant. They were big. They were like huge eyes. And, and they were like all over the place. My next memory that I remember, I was standing at the end of the pier, standing there, about ready to fall off. I know my family running, trying to get me off the pier. They had no idea. How the heck I got I got there because I was only six and the pier was very long and it was like I said it was falling apart. It took me back. Finally, they got somebody there to get me, and I was. Uh, this, I know my father spanked me for sure, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they didn't. They were not too happy. I go. I, I couldn't remember anything. 
Now, did your experiences follow you everywhere you went? In other words, when you left Cuba, did it, you know, did it go to Spain? In Spain, I don't remember. I was only there for almost a year. Uh, we lived in the Madrid, in the capital. Mm -hmm. I was, we lived at a guest, a guest house with the owners and we had a room. I don't remember anything happening there. I do remember reading the paper about what they call in Spanish ovnis or platillos voladores, flying saucers. Mm -hmm. And that caught my attention. And then when I, we moved to, uh, we went to New York first. And for some reason, they wanted to come to Miami. We did. And I started reading. I remember the first books that I read uh, on the subject were like, remember Frank Edwards, mm -hmm. uh, sure. Jack, yeah. Jack's Ballet, even the uh, the Passport to Magonia. That, that's a book that it really impacted me. Uh, also, The Humanoids. by uh, It was edited by Donald, this book right here, a classic. Uh, the humanoids. Uh, oh yeah, Charles Bowen. I've got that book. Bowen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, excellent book. And yeah, and that I started with those two books. I'm I'm fluent. I'm fluent in Spanish and a couple other languages. So I'm re I'm able to read uh, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese. So I got books from all over the place here. But I yeah. uh, that's, that's how I collect the uh, information. Personally, I have I have investigated local cases. I haven't had the, you know, the resources to go travel different places to, you know, do investigations. But a, a lot of local incidents here in Miami, I have investigated. Interesting okay. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, Florida is particularly active. I mean, I looked at that state and there was no way I was going to write about it. It's too many cases. To Look, now <laughs> if, I, if I try to write that book again, it will be like double the size or more. Okay. Like more <laughs> cases. Now, where in Miami were you living? When you came to Miami, I, I live in Miami now. Uh, okay. I live in the little town called West Miami. It's like a little municipality. Yeah. Just west of Miami. Yes. Small, you know, it's from 57th Avenue to 67th Avenue, and yeah. just like small, but the, you know, that's where I live now. Pretty uh, urban. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, Dolly um, grew up largely in Florida. She had a lot of yeah. her experiences in the. Everglades. You know, farm yeah. Everglades, yeah. It's all built up since I've been there. Our farm has been overtaken, you know, it's, you know, been built on. Uh, but uh, back when I was there, if you went out to uh, Bird Road all the way past 128th Avenue, you know, uh, and you would have to go up another side road to go to Tamiami and then go Tamiami out Tamiami. Airport. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tamiami was... West, Tamiami Road. There were farms out there, and I lived on a farm out there. And uh, I'm it was sort of, there were strawberry farms and there were cattle farms. We had Brahma and uh, it was near the Shark Tooth Valley, actually. Yeah. And um, I went to Southwest Valley, Miami yeah. Senior High School. Oh, Southwest Miami. Okay. Yeah. And uh, um, it, it was crazy. I mean, I, but when I first went to Florida, we lived on um, uh, Biscayne Boulevard, right across Biscayne, from okay. the Bay. Yeah. I lived, and, I lived on Biscayne too, off of 23rd Street. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Were you there, Albert, during the whole Gulf Breeze wave? Yeah, there I was in wow. Miami. Yeah, definitely. I got I was I got the book from um, Ed Walters. Right. Uh, there's a lot of controversy with the case, but I think there was some. I think there was some uh, real incidents that uh, occurred up there because he he wasn't the only one involved in, in sightings and encounters. There were other there were independent other witnesses, yeah. many of them. Which were documented by a different investigator, like Mufon and others. Yeah, right. That's and uh, talking about the the Everglades now, uh, they have built so much west that. Uh, I know. But Chrome it's Avenue is Chrome Avenue is still the same. I mean, it's pretty much right. farms. Uh, right. There's some areas that they have gone west, uh, but right. they stop now because they can't go into the East Everglades. I mean, right? No, no, that's that's right. uh, national property yeah, yeah federal land yeah and there's been so, several incidents that I, i've been told about in that area east everglades strange stuff right did they did they fit a ban um airboats out there um the airboats uh, as far as i know i, I had some family come over a couple of years ago and i took them over yeah. to old you know on the trail time right. trail Right. Close to almost to Naples, and we went out on an, in an airboat, and the 
in the glades and they have like airboat tours so i don't think they've been oh, okay. maybe maybe in some places they have been yeah, out I think like in Flo florida country. bay or something i think it's near the mikasuki indian villages i think they banned them it mikasuki, was yeah they're they're still there they got the casino there yeah oh my god see it wasn't when i was a kid a lot of my sightings i used to go out and um i had a canoe you know small canoe and i had to walk it over the estuaries and stuff like that you know or between uh, Indian head mounds, you know, the big mounds out there. And I used to go digging up Indian mounds, looking for stuff, you know, like an archaeologist. And uh, I had my canoe with me because I don't like sawgrass. <laughs> It'll eat you up. And uh, so I spent a lot of time out there. I've had a lot of, count, uh, you know, out sightings out there as well. I drive and, I drive to the Keys all the time, too, and I, I love that ride. Right. There. I, I usually take, uh, not not US-1, the other, what's the name of it? Card Sound Road. Down yeah. There. Out. Yeah. But, uh, you know, talking about uh, incidents there in the glades, uh, I many people in, 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 the, in the police department that I work with knew about my interest. And a lot of them were open about it. They were open about their, their own encounters. And mm -hmm. I had several detectives and police officers come up to me and tell me about what yeah. incidents they... Uh, there was one sergeant that he was out in, a, in a, one of those narcotic stakeout in, in the East Everglades. Okay. Uh, this is possibly 70s, early 70s. You know, there's wasn't any cell right. phone or anything. Like drop zones out there, I know. Yeah. And they were there sitting in the middle of nowhere in the dark, and all of a sudden they looked up and the stars started blacking out in a boomerang shape thing. Yep. And they looked up and they realized it was a huge boomerang. Right. right. Dark. Flying over the feet minimum. Yeah. Flying over the the, uh, the Everglades. Yep. They were yeah. all freaking out. I, I mean, and they in were the out 70s, there. Yeah. 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 Yep. And that's, after, that's after that, too, yeah. after that, I had uh, other people tell me about their, you know, Black Point Marina, Black Point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There were a lot of incidents there, strangely dealing with Bigfoot or what they call down here the skunk ape. Right. The skunk a lot ape. of incidents there and down in the Keys also. Yeah. Mostly in the 70s, 80s. Yeah. I guess because of development and, and stuff uh, slow down, but there's still reports. Uh, a couple of years before I retired, I was manning the phones nine one one, and they had a a, a couple that call, uh -huh. an elderly couple, and they say they were driving the car off of uh, Tamiami near Chrome. I mean, they were yeah. pretty us still. They were north north of Tamiami near the Okeechobee. Okay. Yeah, in Okeechobee. Okay. And they say that a bear, a bear came out of the woods in two legs and, <laughs> struck, and struck their vehicle. Oh, wow. And they and they called the police. And I think they sent a, a traffic patrol up there because they thought it was, they had run over pedestrians. They didn't find anything, but they said it, was, it looked like a bear, but it was very big to them. You know, we have bears down here, but they're small and yeah. black. They're small, they're small black bears. little black bears, yeah. And they go on, mostly on, on four, on four legs. Yeah, there's on not a whole feet. lot to eat down there for them, yeah. No, I had there. I had one sighting. I was out on a dig and I was getting ready to come back. I was packing up my gear and uh, I was walking to go to get my canoe and I felt something over the right side of my shoulder and it was big, whatever was behind me. And I slowly turned because it's thinking I can hear it thinking. And I looked and it's the bloody reptilian. I mean, 10 feet behind me. And I just <laughs> I ran. I didn't even this think about it. In the, in, the, in, in the glades. Yeah. And it had food on its mind. And I made it to my canoe. I had to swim to my canoe. And I didn't even get in it. I just kept paddling away. And I know that it let me go because it could have overrun me at any time. But it was well, huge. I had a, a guy that that used to fish west of, uh, of the turnpike of 58th Street or 25th right. Street, which yeah. is pretty developed now. But back then, it wasn't. Right. Okay. he was fishing off the side of the road and uh, by a canal. Right. And out of the out of the grass, saw grass, or came out a uh, what he said was a walking lizard. Yeah, that's with a it. long neck. Yeah, and I that's talked it. to him personally. And yeah. he just he just he just got out of there. He was there with his nephew, and they both took off. And this, I, is, this, this, is the, this is in the nineties. Yeah, well, this was in uh, like nineteen seventy four. Okay, and I'm already an experiencer by then. Okay, and when I saw it in. Um, I tried to tell myself at first, was that a bloody alligator on its rear feet? You know, because they can get big. And I thought, no, they can't stand up. It's impossible. They have, they yeah. don't have it. 
It cannot. And and I and I knew I could hear it thinking food. You know, it was hungry. And uh, I shook for a week. I mean, I really shook for a week. And I thought, I, I can't meet up with this. I didn't even go back for my gear for a month. I just left it, you know? No. Interesting. A lot of those reptilian reports do occur, seems out in wilderness areas and not necessarily associated with the UFO, which makes me think that they're not necessarily ETs. I know this. we've talked about this, Dolly. Yeah. But perhaps better term, crypto terrestrials. Have you heard that term, Albert? <laughs> yeah. I, I heard also from... Um, rd six six killer clark right she's she's written a lot of books though and i love her but i heard she's been ill lately i don't i don't know i've been trying to contact her no no luck but anyway i used to correspond with her and, and she thinks that the a lot of these reptilians are from underground uh under under the earth yeah yeah and, and i there's a lot right. of reptilian encounters which most of the uh, reptilians are reported to be underground yeah, yeah. I, I've asked about it since then, you know, with my contacts, and they they pretty much said that their their home is Earth, and they've been here for since the dinosaurs, you know, and they call them sentient beings that they're not as evolved as a lot of us are, but they are sentient as all get out, and we you know we're here with them. Which is interesting because yeah. it's not just reptilians; it's Bigfoot, <laughs> and, you know, dolphins, and you know other cetaceans are probably sentient too. At least a large degree. Yeah. But now, now there's a lot of talk about dogman and all these different type, all the cryptics. All I, got, the I got a couple of reports of that myself. That's what I love about your humanoid books, is because it covers all of these things. A whole spectrum <laughs> type. Of so, what was your very yeah. first uh, report on a humanoid? I mean, what what prompted you to want to catalog everybody? Well, like I said, I, the the book Passport to Magonia. That's one of the first books okay. that that illustrated a, a whole bunch of humanoid encounters. I mean, he has a, a listing of 900 cases there, and a lot of them are humanoid encounters. Also, the book that I showed you guys earlier, the, the humanoid, by Hanlon. And and that's the, that's I, my interest peaked. And when I read UFO cases, I didn't want to read about lights in the sky, close encounters is the first type of stuff like that. I just look for humanoid abduction cases and some of the cases that there were really high strangeness cases I I collect those also. Wow. Now, now did you ever join MUFON or I mean you I know you had your own case where you sent a letter to APRO after a sighting you and your sister had? Yeah. I remember that back in the early 70s or late 60s in Miami. Uh, I, I I am a member of MUFON now, but just regular member. I don't do any investigation for them or anything like that. There right. used to be a used to be a really active MUFON group here in South Dade. Mary Sim Simmerman or Simmer Mary Ann Simmer, but they she passed away. Her husband also, and no one took up the uh, gauntlet. Uh, I couldn't do it, but there was another investigator here, Virgilio Sanchez Osejo. He wrote the book uh, sure. uh, "Underwater UFO Base." I knew yeah. him personally. I I, he, <laughs> I used to visit him all the time. He used to have meetings in the back of his in his backyard with UFO oh, enthusiasts. Wow. I know we have a lot of them down here, but we're kind of isolated now. Yeah. So. Wow. Wow. Well, so so you started collecting all these reports just for yourself, or were you ever thinking about you know publishing I, them? You know, I never thought I was going to publish them. I I. I I will share a lot of my information, uh, my database, different. Right. And then somebody said, "Look, you have a. Why don't you write a book about it?" And I didn't want to. I didn't want to. And finally, I was convinced. Uh, Ash Stanton, he published the books himself, and I ended up doing sixteen books. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we have that, a question. No, this is just a comment, actually. Oh. <laughs> Um, UFO books, Bigfoot says, Albert, I have almost all the humanity books. Love them. And thanks for the autographed copy. Uh, <laughs> oh, You're welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely love them. I know at one point your database was free and people could access it at any point. I wanted to keep it that way. Uh, UFO info site, but the uh -huh. owner of that site he had family problems. His, his wife passed away. So he had a close UFO info, so I had to remove my cases from there. 
I want to put in. I wanted to put them back on, but uh, I was told by while I was publish, publishing the uh, books, I couldn't have the cases on online for free. So I don't uh -huh. know. But I but I want if I can't publish any more books, I'm going to put them back online again. That's what I'm trying to do now. That's cool. Yeah, well, they're and they're absolutely they're affordable like, too. So I think it's, it's only fair that people, you get compensated because it's it's a lot of work. I know how much work it is to, and I am amazed at how you're able to get these cases from all over the world. It's a lot of work, a lot of work for years and years. And it's not really, I mean, you know, you know, the, you're not going to become a millionaire selling UFO books. I mean, maybe <laughs> in a month I'll get like a $200 and 150, you know, <laughs> so it, it's really not, uh, but it's something. <laughs> that is. Now, do you group uh, them by categories? In other words, like all the really tall, you know, I have um, categories, C, three ca categories, like type A, B, C, E, okay. D, F, G. Then I have H for recovery of a crash UFO or entity. Mm -hmm. Type X, which is a really high strangeness case, not necessarily uh, involving a humanoid. And I have type uh, I, which involve injuries in the part of the uh, witnesses. And wow. uh, type F, which is a, a, psych, a psychic connection between a UFO and, and a witness. Type, right. B, type A is the one that you see a, a, a humanoids or uh, entities on board a UFO through a window or what, what have you. Type B, when they land and they exit. Type C, when there's a UFO in nearby and there are humanoids here, but they're not, not, they're not seen to go directly inside the UFO, but they're nearby. Mm -hmm. it's a, uh, I try to keep them like that. Wow. So oh, cool. here's, here's, here's um, the whole chronology of all your books. And my question is, you know, these go back 100 mm. years. And, 100, uh, yeah. I mean, it's amazing how far back these go. You know, these very, very early cases are a little bit different from some of the modern ones. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Have you seen sort of an evolution in what people report over the years? Now is so much complicated. Uh, now it seems like the grays have taken over. Uh, because if, if you look at the Passport to Magonia database and the, uh, and the Bowen book, there are hundreds of cases there of humanoids, and not one of them describes a gray type entity. And sometimes you wonder, this is in the 60s, 50s. <laughs> right. And not even 70s yet because in the early 70s 70 that's when the people started reporting so-called grays i don't even think the the betty hill and barney hill the, what they encountered were not really grays they were taller they had uniforms that slanted eyes but they were not the short big-headed grays that people talk about yeah. now it, it's it, it seems it seems like people think that that's the only all extraterrestrials are the little Big headed great, yeah. and Preston knows that that's not the truth. That's right. There are different yeah. ethnicities different. of the gray. Yeah. Some are very small and short, and some of them are very, very tall. And uh, over the years, uh, things have shifted with ET anyway, because they have things that is going on in our galaxy and are in away from us. And right, right, they're moving uh, groups toward us, and then other groups are having to attend to what they got issues with. And, and maybe they they right. moved different groups from here to another location and brought different ones here. Who knows? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. They're all they're all humanoid, which I find interesting because this is one of the things that sort of kept me out of the field. It all seemed very much like Star Trek to me. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I, I would expect ETs to be completely different. You know, you remember the movie The Blob? I don't know if you've seen yeah, it. But the Blob, yeah. <laughs> kind of what yeah. I was looking for, but that just wasn't the case. Well, so maybe the, I don't know, maybe the humanoid form is a universal thing. I don't it know. It is. It, it, that's yeah. why I wanted Preston to call the book Symmetry. We all have DNA. And and uh, I don't know how many encounters that you've talked to witnesses and all, but uh, a lot of them, I mean, a lot of people come back with the message that they're us, we're them, we're all one. And our DNA is universal throughout our, so you know, throughout our universe and our solar systems. And it's it's important to remember that, that they are like us. You know, and uh, they've been coming to humans 
to time immemorial all the way back, even tens of thousands of years before anybody knew what anything was, you know, and people don't I think, think about that. They've yeah, always I think, been yeah, I think they're inter they might have interacted with a other civilizations civilizations here on earth before ours that were here before absolutely yes and they absolutely. uh something happened there was a uh catastrophe yeah. either a meteorite or comet something and they were wiped out uh, there were some re remnants but those you can find all over places in the world right and, well, uh, Bolivia. How, yeah how common do you think humanoid encounters are because researching myself talking to people mm. almost nobody reports it to anyone they don't call the police they don't call the air force they don't even know what mufon or new fork is so here you've got um, a, thousands upon thousands of them what, what was it 20 30 thousand i'll give you an example uh back in uh 89 i was working the midnight shift at the uh, 911 desk and a security guard called 911 that this case is in one of my books this is back in 89 i i think december december and he said that he was patrolling back then you know, no cell phone so he was calling from a pay phone down 911 the emergency number he said there were three strange uh trespassers in the parking lot this is about three o'clock in the morning and we asked him okay what do they look like we have we're going to send the police oh they're about seven feet tall and their eyes are, they look like cats and they're skinny long long arms the security guard. So this guy was so afraid that he actually called 911 when he saw the police were sent immediately. <laughs> well, I don't know if immediately, but they did go. They did file a report. I had, I used to have a copy of the report. I know what happened to it. But they did believe this guy, and they did search the area back then. This is off of 136 Street and US 1. Yeah. Oh, back wow. then, yeah, back then yeah. there was a shopping center here and a field on the other side. And that's... And, they searched that field. They didn't. They didn't find anything. They searched the parking lot, but there were. He said there were three beings, almost seven feet tall. And mm -hmm. he he called the police to report it. And had a, other another lady called. This is ninety four. She called the police because in the at night there was. She looked at there was a mango tree in her backyard, and when she looked, she said it looked like a gargoyle was standing next to the tree, or trying to climb on the tree. He said she, <laughs> said, it was, she said on the phone that it looked like the devil. He was yeah. like a demon. I guess that's what a gargoyle looks like. I guess. Yeah, demon. I had a gargoyle jump out of a tree at me up in Pine Mountain. I was coming home from the base <laughs> and it's raining and I'm driving down this road with no, you know, no lights. And uh, it's pouring rain and I'm trying really hard to stay on the road. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And I see this tree lighting up in my headlights. I know where I am. And I see something up in the tree and I'm thinking, hmm, what is that? You know? And the next thing I know, as I go under the tree, it pfft, right under my windshield, it came hit hard and it scratched the windshield with nails and it was on my hood and I slammed on my brakes and it slid down the front of my truck and hit the ground. At which point I went, hmm, and I kept going. I ran right <laughs> over it. <laughs> I didn't, I don't know. Amazing. How, how big was it? It was uh, probably three feet tall, and it, it probably weighed about eighty-five pounds. It was wow. huge, and it had little floppy wings, and it looked just like a black gargoyle. It was huge, and it covered my entire windshield when I hit it. It left scratches, and uh, I went home. I lived like two two blocks from that, up on the mountain in a log cabin, and I sat on my I went changed my clothes, got my shotgun, pumped it, and sat on my porch for the rest of the night waiting for it. And it never showed up. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> it scared yeah. me. It went, and I told my, this is one I told my mom about. And uh, she loves gargles. And she said, that was a gargle. That was a gargle. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. So, yeah. so, Albert, you know, with all these humanoid reports, you know, there are Bigfoot and reptilian stuff, which could probably be categorized as crypto terrestrials. And some, you know, perhaps interdimensional time travelers. I mean, people start marching on all these theories. I'm wondering, Together, yeah, yeah are you convinced that most of these humanoids are extraterrestrial in the classic sense? People like us, biological beings. I, I think I think a lot of them are interdimensional, actually, or they use dimensions to travel from different places, from here to there, from distant planets. They might use wormholes, like the movie uh, Interstellar. Who knows? Maybe they come in through an, another uh, dimension. 
and then they go into our dimension briefly and then they disappear going back to their dimension and they indeed are extraterrestrial but a lot of the crypto beings lesser developed i think they're also not necessarily extraterrestrial but they're interdimensional that for some reason are able to break into our into our uh, realm briefly and or sometimes longer than briefly and then are seen and then they disappear back into their dimension where they came from and sometimes humans are able to go into their dimension and sometimes we never come back that's what i there's a lot of so many reports missing 411 in the woods i think that's that's one of that's one of the reasons all right well i want to pull up a picture here that you sent to me <clears throat> about a case from 1916 in the uk yeah. this is an, UK, yeah. it's funny I, I had a dream just about this not too long ago so I, I was kind of struck by the image this is different from what a lot of people report and, and such this an early is, report it, it's strange because it, it, it's just like you see it a platform with men in uniform standing around it i know it was back in 16 1916 during the war, uh, first world war and i I have I have a write up of the report, but I can't send it through here. But uh, they uh, that's what they saw. There was no uh, sign of engines or any supporting platforms or anything. We just flying through the air like that. I I, I I mean, this is one of those cases which just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I wonder if this is Man. us doing reverse engineering, but it's so Some darn guy. long ago. Yeah, I, I, I question that. It was 1914. You said. 16, uh, I think 16, 1916. Yeah. In the UK. What do you, what do you think, Dolly? <laughs> I think that the craft went, uh, you know, they can, have you ever seen those leaves? You touch them, they turn there. You can see through them. That's oh, because there's something in the skin of, uh -huh, they, there's something in the skin. It's light cells and they change. They alter suddenly. The craft, ET craft are like cuttlefish. They, they have a raise in the uh, skins of them. And the being that controls the craft can make it cloak itself or it can make itself transparent. The mainframe of it is still there. You can see the mainframe, but you, you it's like everything else disappears. And I think oh, you're okay. looking at, it, at a craft that's opened up so you can see through it in there, just looking like they're touring around. This, this one is somewhat remin reminiscent of yeah. uh, Father Gill sighting in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, yeah, there were men standing outside and waving at the uh, witnesses. Yeah, right. I mean, exactly. I don't think there was—I don't think there was an interaction here. But yeah. interesting. It, it, yeah. I mean, what what she's what Dolly said it, it makes sense. Maybe they decloaked temporarily so yeah. they could they, they just for some reason made everything transparent so everybody could see three sixty around them. Or they accidentally. must be looking at something important. I wonder what was going on on the ground that they were watching. You know. Because things catch their attention sometimes, and they'll go out of their way to watch things. I don't know the things place was the place where it was seen was called Alderberg. I don't mm -hmm. know if there was anything going on there at the time, but I know World War II was on, but World War II was mostly in, in, in yeah. mainland mainland Europe, not in the UK. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Well, they can do that. Yeah, it's a very interesting case, and what kind of struck me is that it's so it predates the modern age of UFOs. Yeah. People weren't even really thinking extraterrestrials way back then, or humanoids. Yeah. I mean, the, the amount of humanoid reports compared to today, it's almost non-existent. So it's hard, yeah, it's hard to find a newspaper. Some of the, uh, the some of the old newspaper ac accounts that I have found have been or shared with me. It, they describe encounters with entities, but they're all put in a. Uh, in a ghost category or specter whatever they they saw a glowing white shape entity in the field mm -hmm. is a, was a ghost back then it's a ghost i'm talking about the 1914 15 20 yeah. maybe even 20. Not any other way to understand it oh so yeah. maybe there the were encounters but they were misinterpreted but you know well, what do you think about the sudden onslaught of humanoid and ufo reports and with the modern age of ufos because it seems unprecedented no. if you go back in history it's not it's just not there what's interesting is the las vegas case from back back this in may 1st there's right. been a lot of disinformation 
thrown out out there. They didn't really take a film or a picture of the alien. Right. The, 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 the officers, what they captured was some kind of object. It was probably a, a fireball or something, but Meteor. something something landed. Because sometimes maybe these craft, they use that type of event to camouflage themselves and, and, and come in. When everybody's looking at the meteorite, they're landing over here. So we get distracted. But this is what, one of my theories. But anyway, they something landed in their backyard, and they called the police. They called 911. And they said there were, a, one of the neighbors said there was a large round thing with light, and there was inside there was an eight-foot tall creature, or even taller, with big eyes. Smaller. And then there was another one outside. Now, I like, I wish I could talk to this kid that reported that, but uh, it seems like it was a, a very interesting case. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll get some good reporting on it because there's so much disinformation about it. There is. There's a lot of BS. Which is a huge problem in this field. Yeah. I want to bring yeah. up another unusual humanoid uh, picture that's from Ooh. 1947. Santina. Yeah, Villa Santina, Italy, yeah. So one of one of the classic uh, early C threes or close encounters of the third kind, and uh, it's funny that this is the drawing made years later after there have been other drawings, but the, this is more accurate. Uh, the creatures they were humanoid, of course. He looks like he's wearing a helmet or something, but it's the the, the skin tone is kind of greenish tint. And the eyes are like like a cat also, yeah. like slit. And yeah. um, and this guy, he tried to approach them, but he he was out in the mountains and he had a, a, a one of those. It was near a glacier or something. He had an ice pick, and he went like this, and he got struck by uh, some kind of beam that knocked him out for like he was laying on the ground for a couple of hours. Yeah. He messed up his vision and all that, but. Maybe they misinterpreted his action because you can't go run up to somebody with an ice pick in your hand. Right. They would, but, they, uh, would have, they would have stopped him. Yeah. When I look at that, I see a cat creature. They they sort of look like mm -hmm. that. And what he thought was a green tint was probably the gray that in certain light looks green. If he was up on a glacier, the blue light hitting the gray skin might have given it a green cast to it, you know? But uh, they, they have big cat eyes and their nose is blunt like a cat and they have facial oh, hair no. and they cut their hair like that you know they'll try to look as human as possible and so okay. i'm pretty sure you saw a cat creature yeah all righty yeah. yeah it's a pretty interesting case to say the least and there's just so many of them i think it's far more common than people realize because there was a quote from jay allen hynek which always kind of comes to mind that he said one in 40 people have had an onboard experience, which seemed to me far too common. But that, that's when I started asking everyone I knew. And I didn't have to ask 40 people. And I know that the cases you cover are not just face to face encounters, they're onboard experiences as well. So I'm wondering what your take is on the whole onboard experience. You know, I think eventually a lot of the people that had a, a close encounter with an entity or a UFO. It turns out that they would really abduct it also when later on they start remembering they have memories flashes and right. and they might remember that there was something else occurred and most witnesses nowadays are like dolly they're repeat witnesses they had several encounters throughout the yeah. year yeah yeah there's a question preston you read it it says i have a question for albert this is from ct guitar guy 85 what about Mothman? Is that interdimensional? Mm. Have there been more modern sightings of Mothman? It's a good I, question. I think, yeah, I think Mothman was in, indeed uh, some kind of interdimensional creature that for some reason made his appearance up back in Point Pleasant. As far as modern sightings, there have been a lot. Like the Chicago uh, flying creature uh, reports that started cropping up uh, since 2016. There are hundreds of those already. And lately, uh, I have a connection in Puerto Rico, a um, Puerto Rican researcher, Jorge Martin. And he's he's been reporting a lot of uh, last year, starting 2020, through last year, to, to 2021, a lot of uh, flying humanoid encounters down there lately now. And gargoyle-type creatures also have been seen. Uh, I have uh, several... Uh, 
Well, those cases in my latest summary. Uh, Preston, do, uh, do I have your email? Um, I think so. If not, I can okay. certainly give it to you. Yeah. Well, I want to send you my uh, a file so you could take a look at it. You feel free to use it. You like? yeah, I think th I find the yeah. Mothman case pretty interesting because it kind of came out of the blue, but then it sparked a lot of other people reporting these kinds of things. And looking into it, you know, when I was writing UFOs over New Mexico, I got a case of these guys driving down the highway and something swooped down their, over their car and they said it looked like an owl man. <laughs> and they later had, it came to their house. So this was a, you know, a follow-up, which is often happens, as you know, Albert, and one encounter can precede others. Yes. yes. And looking into it, there's quite a few of these winged creature sightings. How, how big are they? I'm curious. How big are the Mothmen? Well, the like ones that the ones have been seen in Chicago and late lately, they're pretty tall, they're over six feet tall, close yeah. to seven feet. There were the recent others. ones in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's very very odd. I don't know if those are directly associated with UFOs, and I wonder. I don't about know, but a, a lot of them been seen near O'Hare Airport for some reason. Why? I yeah. have no idea. Well, there was a flying humanoid that was pestering LAX Airport. And people were thinking it was perhaps, you know, one of the guys with the jet pack. And then apparently, no, it wasn't because other people saw it and it was moving far too quickly. But, yeah, a lot of cases of flying humanoids with even without wings. A lot of those, yeah. Just somebody flying through the air without any means of propulsion or anything like that, which is yeah, so, very interesting. So have you, Albert, seen humanoids other than, you know, what you saw as a kid personally? I don't know if this is, I included this in uh, what I sent you one time. Uh, you know, sometimes when you have an experience like that, at that moment, you don't, you don't take it in completely. You right. go, well, okay. And then maybe a couple of days later or, or two days later or whatever, you go, wait, wait a minute. What, what was that? What did I see? I remember one time I was, I was visiting my mom and I was backing out. She lived. She lived in Cora Gables. I was uh, it's a lot of wooded streets there, so I was backing up out of her, uh, her complex, and I looked, and there was it was it wasn't even night. It was like maybe after late afternoon, but it was an area there wasn't that much that much traffic. So I looked, and there was somebody standing in the middle of the street, and when I looked, I said, "What? Well, what a strange guy! He was tall, humongous, all in white." And he looked like he had some. His his back was very. His shoulders were very wide, and he he turned and he looked like he had huge wings, white in color. Everything was white, and he had. But he was. He kind of avoided my my looking at me. But I I looked and then I didn't think not much about it, and I just drove away. And yeah. now I'm convinced that I saw something. You know, some type of humanoid. Well, I have a question for you then. Have you ever cataloged any of the reports of Anunnaki and what they looked like? Somebody that, I mean, that had reported. In other words, country... from past, you know, like from, from Persia and, you know, uh, Mesopotamia and all those areas, the Anunnaki were an actual, um, uh, quote, people that were living there, but they weren't from here. And they're in hieroglyphs and everything. And there are other hieroglyphs from different parts of the world that have pictures of Anunnaki on them. And what you're describing to me, because I've seen them, is an Anunnaki. And I'm just curious about that. Yeah. I, I knew Dolly was going to say this. <laughs> well, it, maybe because I have read about the Anunnaki and how they came to Earth thousands of years ago. Yeah, they're very tall. I mean, really tall. The young ones aren't as tall. They're about seven feet tall. They go, they're like tall whites. They get taller as they get older, okay? Yeah. It's a genetic trait of theirs. And um, they get massively huge. And uh, they have big wings. They really do. Hmm. Well, big that's white. what this guy looked like. And he was big. He, yeah. He was, very, he was very big. And if he was wearing uh, white, that sounds like an Anunnaki to me. So. And I just drove away. I didn't even... Back then, I, you know, I didn't. I didn't. I guess I couldn't react. Uh, who knows? Have you talked to your family about, you know, have have other members of the family had encounters involving missing uh, time? I know your I, sister. And, uh, my uh, a couple of my sons have seen, had experiences. Uh, my sister also. 
my mom, the, the, she's she's not well now, but she didn't, she never did recall anything. My grandmother, though, she used to tell me stories about incidents that would have would occur to people in the middle of nowhere in Cuba and the farms. They will go out and they will encounter different type of beings. Or uh, my grandfather was he, he will go out there in their, on their horse, and he was followed once by a, a huge ball of fire that closed oh, wow. behind him. And yeah, there are many other reports, but uh, for my family, uh, like I said, my sister and my sons they're they're interested on in it, but not as much as me. Like when I, uh, I don't know when, when I'm gone, hopefully my database will, will be in somebody's hands that, uh, that will put it to use, you know? Wow. Yeah. That's well, amazing. doesn't, you know, what you're saying doesn't surprise me because when you're showing, as I'm sure, you know, all the markers of a contactee and it is generational. So, yeah. so another question I would ask you because, because, you know, it sounds like you were fit that category is, have you had a lot of psychic experiences in terms of, you know, dreams that come true or astral projection? <clears throat> or, I you know, I have have a lot of like, uh, like, what do you call that? Uh, uh, when something happens at the same time or deja vu, deja vu, and stuff like that, and then synchronicity <laughs> all the time. Yeah, for some reason. Uh, you, uh, would, a lot, everybody's psychic, okay? We all have the ability. But uh, people who have encounters generally are showing uh, more signs, latent signs mm -hmm. of it and, and ongoing signs of it before, during, or after an, an encounter. It's it's a corresponding thing with that, you know? So I find I, that very interesting. Some of my dreams have uh, been so lucid that it, it feels like I... I've been there. I, I go there, and I had a. I have had dreams, not not all the time, but yeah, a couple of dreams involving UFOs, actually. Yeah. Do you ever go home to Cuba in your dreams? I mean, you're like standing there, and you're actually replaying a moment. I do not dream about going back. I haven't done that. If I did, I don't remember it. Okay. But I do dream. A lot when I was in the Navy, though. Okay. I was there for four years. I was a communications mm -hmm. technician, radioman. I had a top secret clearance. And uh, I do dream once in a while going back to the ship for some okay. reason. Okay. That's significant. What, what kind yeah. of ship were you on? A destroyer tender. Okay. Out of Mayport, Florida. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> how, how about that? Well, here I want to put up a question, which is a little bit off topic, but uh, it's from chat and all questions are welcome. So, you know, there's been a lot of interesting developments in the field with disclosure and whistleblowers. And Stephen Greer has sort of helped spearhead that to a degree. And you don't have to answer this, but would you let, would like to you to ask what Albert thinks about Steve Greer? You feel free to pivot <laughs> anyway. I don't generally no, comment no. on re other researchers. I, I think he's doing some important work. I'll leave it at that. But I thought I'd give you the I, opportunity. I, I mean, he's he's uh, he has exposed he has spoke a lot of people, exposed a lot of people to the phenomenon, and opened doors here and there. But uh, after that, you know, I I haven't heard too much too many good things about him. But I don't have you know I don't want to I don't have right. a personal opinion right now no, on him. Yeah, I you have to totally give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, if you know somebody personally, you can't comment on them. It's it's not okay. It's gossip. I don't. I don't you know him personally. I, right. I can't comment negative on him because right. I I haven't had any experience with him. But yeah, I have actually. I met him. He was very kind to me, and I joined C SETI, and we did use his protocols to call down UFOs, and it worked. We formed a little group in LA. So yeah, I've been a number of times. We've had a few okay discussions but yeah he's i think he is doing some important work in the field and i have to give kudos to anyone who has the courage to step into this field at all <laughs> because you know what i'm I mean? be, be so exposed yeah really right. yeah. well it draws okay. fire too i mean if you're yeah. if you're working toward this and you're trying to bring a disclosure to people and explain things to them it draws the wrong people looking at you and they'll come after you and they do 
and that might be part of his problem. You never know, you know? Right. Well, we have to take a, a quick station break just to let everyone know that you're watching The Light Gate. This is episode number eight. I'm Preston Dennett. My lovely co-host is Dolly Safran. Our guest is Albert Rosales, author, experiencer, and researcher. And you're listening to the UFO Paranormal Radio Network and uh, United Public Radio Network. We're also streaming on 107.7 and 105.3 FM from the beautiful state city of New Orleans and then several New other New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, New Orleans, New Orleans. New Orleans, yeah. New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah. yeah. I got to get that Cajun accent down. New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, so we're on several other platforms, and thank you for joining us. We're now in our second hour. We're going to be answering some more of the questions from chat. So if you have any, please put them in caps. That makes it easier for us. But I've got another case, Albert, that you sent us a little picture of. So I wonder if you could comment about it because this one is interesting to me because it involves so many different oh, types oh, of ETs. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, one of my favorite cases. Uh, this occurred back in, in in the fall of 73, an important year. It had occurred in November in France. And I don't remember the location, but there was a couple in their car. Like what, what couples do in their vehicles alone in the middle of nowhere near a field, and they saw uh, some kind of object land, like a dome in a field, about maybe uh, 300 feet from them. There was a fence, and it landed, and some kind of uh, hatch opened a door, and three short figures came out. These were not not typically gray, but they were short, big-headed humanoids, wearing silvery suits, very tight-fitting, and they walked around. Well, and then suddenly two more figures stepped out of the UFO. And these were like some two figures that resemble like the tall Nordics. They were tall males and they had long blonde hair and they were wearing tight fitting blue suits. They stood in front of the object. They didn't walk anywhere. And thirdly, and most weirder of all, Something else came out of the object. It was a, uh, something that looked like a big ape, according to the witnesses. They didn't say Bigfoot. They say they say big ape, and this big ape stood at, right next to the door of the entrance to the UFO, as if it was guarding the area or guarding or keeping a lookout. Maybe it was a some kind of bodyguard. Or something. What? Who knows? After a while, the little the little ones went back, entered the ship followed by the two tall, tall blonde ones. And finally, the uh, ape-like creature went in behind them, then it took off. And in that field, they, were, they found several type of footprints and a lot of evidence. This happened back in November 1973. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the whole Bigfoot UFO connection? Because I got a case personally, and that's what made me look into it. Of course, what's his name? Stan Gordon, Gordon Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, yeah. Yeah, has really focused think, on that. Yeah, I think there's de there's a definite connection between uh, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Skunk Ape, and UFOs. And I believe that the Sasquatch is an, an intelligent being, is not an animal. Right. So well, don't, go out hunt, no, don't go out hunting no. Bigfoot because they're, they're probably more intelligent than we are. I know for sure a lot of them have telepathic capabilities and they could right. some of them can become invisible. All exactly. Kinds of stuff. Yeah, so, that's yeah. exactly what I've heard, which is I think important because yeah. this would explain a lot why they're not seen as often. And people say, you know, there's not, there's a lot of evidence. I mean, it's not just footprints. There's oh, maybe they, they use portals to travel. Also, some of them they disappear in plain sight, or come out of nowhere, and then they disappear. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's a comment I'm just going to bring up because it's kind of cool. Giorgio P Piacenza says, in the 90s, yeah. I saw a huge orb over the Chrome Avenue area. That okay. that area, Chrome Avenue, has been a lot of sightings there. Hot. Yeah, Miller Road, yeah. too, actually. Miller Just Road, so you yeah. know, yeah. Yeah. It's, I wonder why Florida yeah. is so darn active because, it's, I mean, I know there's California has the most reports, but we have the most people. 
And I think Texas and Washington are also, Texas, I can understand it's huge. Washington, well, that's where New Fork is centered. So they get a lot of reports. But I know Florida is right up there in the top 10. That's Michigan. The, that's, uh, the field guidelines of the planet are very strong in the state of Florida and Texas. You know, the 33rd parallel is probably the strongest field guideline. And then going uh, dead south from that, they get stronger and stronger. Going north, it's a little bit different. They're a little bit wishy-washy up in the north, even though they ride them. So, yeah, it's it's literally a, a good place for them to go. The magnetics there is real easy for them to fly. Well, like Preston said, California is like number one for some yeah. reason. I guess, you know, like you said, there are more people there. It's a large, you know, state. And Florida and then Texas, yeah. Texas is a lot of lot of stuff there too. Yeah. Have you noticed certain areas that are more active than others in terms of worldwide? Pennsylvania, for sure. I mean, that place is nonstop. Uh UFOs, uh Sasquatch, all kind all kinds of paranormal events, uh contact, you know, all kinds of stuff going on there. Giant bird sightings, pterodactyls, who knows? All kinds of stuff. Yeah, well, the, is there any, the human reports are all over the world. I mean, there's not a, there's, you know, going through your books on this, there's, I don't think there's a single country that hasn't had reports. Um, they, there are reports for most countries for some reason uh, in Africa. A lot of the smaller countries there, like uh, West Africa, uh, are low, very low in reports. Um, South Africa, it's a lot of reports. Uh, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, in that area, Angola, there's some reports from there. And you go north, Central Africa, uh, very quiet also, except for Nigeria a little bit. There's been a lot of reports from there. And Uganda, some reports from there. And then you go north, and you do see a lot of reports coming from Morocco, Egypt. Not too much you hear from Libya, Algeria, or Tunisia some but not almost nothing but i've been trying to locate different uh, reports in, from areas that for some reason you never hear reports come from out of you have to go where uh, nuclear capabilities are literally yeah. if, if there are nuclear plants nuclear things going on anything with nuclear they're gonna they're gonna be way more reports because they watch that you know well and like in uh, africa and nigeria Congo, they had the, ur the uranium mines there, and they had exactly. UFO sightings there. You're exactly right. Yep. Yeah, there's I, certainly I, a lot of sightings I, over mines. I noticed that was a pattern. Yeah. In schoolyards, I think, yeah, when I was doing that, I think you sent me a couple. So thank you for oh, that. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> well, that's definitely a draw for. I was drugs. listening to your last um, episodes of the uh, strain of strange effects on people, UFOs. Right. And, <laughs> Most of the times I, I know the cases because I've, I've been a, a, around so long. But one case I didn't know about that was the last one, so the one from the Mojave Desert, about the guy that went out there and he saw a UFO land and then he found something, a glowing mass on right. the floor. Very interesting. And I have never heard of that case before. Yeah. Every now and then I surprise you. <laughs> yeah. I got, I, got, I got that other one with the yeah. – Kid who shot yeah. a big foot. Yes. yes, and there's even a newspaper report on it. I, I was, I was really, I was really nicely surprised because that report. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, here is another kind of interesting question, which comes from Donna's, Donna's happy hour. Happy hour. And I like this question. And the question is: Does anyone know if reptilian can shape shift? And this question intrigues me because I do know of cases. One comes to mind, which actually I think is from Florida, if I'm correct, where a lady was at a gas station and saw this beautiful man leaning up against her car in kind of a seductive way. And it's not her habit to pick up strangers, but she felt compelled to. Long story short, went home and became intimate and looked at the mirror and saw that it wasn't a man at all. It was a gray. So I'm thinking, I mean, that's a hypnotic progression. You know, right. projection perhaps yes yeah. you're All they're around. not shape shifting but they are giving you an idea of what you, they let you see what you want to see in other words they want to scare you and they they you know read your mind and they can send you in the direction they want you to go 
I have a couple co a couple cases from reptilians that they do change from being a reptilian to a human type. And then when you first see him, it's a human, very tall human type person. But then you look back again, then they had, it's a reptilian now with a long with a long tail and huge. You know, I have you know, an opinion about that. Yeah. I don't think anybody's going to like what I say <laughs> at all. But uh, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, there's factions out there that are not exactly on the up and up in the world. Uh, there's a definitely in a, a black ops, a cabal of sorts worldwide, and they have the ability to give you 70 holographic images and then change them right before your very eyes. They like to mess with you. And I think that's what people are starting to see, that, that they're propagating the idea that they're shape shifting when they're really not. You're seeing a projected image and it's disconcerting, you know. I that's, guess to my opinion. misinformation throw people off. Yes, know. very much so. Yeah. Well, yeah, I hope well, they're practicing on everybody to see how much you'll buy and you won't buy. You know, humans are pretty good at uh, trying to discern BS. Okay. And I think that they've been working on the human population for a long time to see what they'll, you know, be swayed into. Okay. And they do have 70 holographics and they do use it on us. So. Yeah, well, as long as our government isn't reptilian, I think we're fine. Because <laughs> people talk about that. And this is, yeah. I think, important to mention because it's important. This is why I like your research, Albert. You, you just lay it out. It's not wild speculation. There's so much wild speculation in this yeah. field. And I, I would like include that. that there. So oh, they, they always said that the royal family were reptilians or uh, reptilians. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I don't yeah so. of course. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anything's it. possible here. I'll bring up. Uh, <laughs> Let me see if I can pull up this other uh, slide you sent me. It's going to take me just a second. Let me see here. No, that's the one we already have because there's. Oh, here it is. Doon, doon, doon. Sorry, I should have had this ready, but this is an interesting case which struck me because there's so many like this, uh, which I would call the Michelin men. Michelin I just men, covered, yeah. uh, covered a case in France involving a, a, a professor who saw guys just like this coming out. And I know of yeah. another case yeah. in France. I think there's several cases here in the U S several, several so. in, in France and, and Spain also. Yeah. This, this particular image is from a case in Brazil. And the in interesting part is it occurred last year in July, 2022. So it was less than a year ago. It occurred at a, uh, in, in the state of Rio Grande do Norte in Brazil. And there was a businessman that he was out returning from from uh, somewhere. And he, he saw a couple of beings. One was about seven feet tall. The other one was, was short like, the, like that, four feet tall. But they looked the same. They look like they have rubber, or, you know, around their body, like like a tire made out of like, like a Michelin man. And the tall one had a, like a visor, and the latter one had two holes for where the eye should be. And he saw him in a field, and he stopped the car, and they they then they disappear. He didn't see a UFO, but he definitely saw the two uh, Michelin yeah. men. And I want everybody the, the drawing. Homework. Yeah. I'm going to give everybody homework tonight, okay? I want you all to start looking at the type of robots that are in operation right now, autonomous uh, robots, military, everything. Uh, they have the ability to build these guys. They have some that are so agile, they can chase you up a mountain and leave you split. They have all kinds of weird shapes, weird designs and everything, and they're using them, and they pick different places around the planet to deploy them to see how they're going to act in different situations. And I'm having a funny feeling about this. I think that this is might be what they're looking at. Well, the the, Mich the Michelin the Michelin man type has been seen for years. From yeah, I know that uh, they've had the 50s. These, yeah. yeah, yeah, since the 40s, 50s, they've been working on this. So not kidding. Cool. Yeah, okay. well, it's interesting that they are all over the world. This is just yeah. a comment from Janice Connett, who says, "Wow, just went to Amazon to see all of Albert's books. A treasure trove of reading. Thank you, Thank Albert." You. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the ch uh, chat room is just buzzing about your right. research. It's it's really quite inspiring. So um, you've been at this for so many years. 
Do you ever get to the point where you're like, I just need a break. I'm living and breathe. I, I, you know what I mean? I sometimes you feel know, that way, but then I'm right back in. <laughs> that's what happens to me. I go, no, I got to take a break. Maybe I'm, I let it go yeah. for six, three or four months, but then I'm, I'm right back into it. Full, so, full blast. <laughs> are you working right now or are you just, you're retired and you're, and you're doing this because you love it. I'm, I'm retired and I'm, I'm just doing this. I used to do it when I was working too, but yeah. Lesser. Yeah. Now, do you go out to like the different um, cons and stuff like that, the conventions, and talk about your books or anything like that? No. Wow. No, I I I do you know po podcasts and stuff like this, but I haven't got. A, I was supposed to go to one in, in Las Vegas a couple years ago, and it was canceled. So oh. then I did go to Las Vegas last year. I had a good time there. I actually <laughs> went down to uh, Area Fifty One. That area. Did you see the black mailbox? I saw that, and I saw awesome. the uh, the, yeah. the gate, and yeah. and it was a not a, a black SUV. It was a white SUV on top of the hill, looking yeah. down. I went on a tour. A guy took drove me and my sister over. Wow. Yeah. Well, here's another question, which I think we've already kind of covered a little bit, but I'll say it again. It's from Doxy, and they're asking, "Do you think that they show us themselves?" As they, let me see. As they think, we think they look like. Okay, that's a little tongue twister there. Interesting, <laughs> interesting question. There's been reports in which actually people have encountered human, supposedly human-like aliens. I, I could think of a couple from Russia, and they've they've been told that the the reason we look this way because we don't you don't want us to, you, we don't want you to see our true form. I mean, I don't know how accurate that case was, but there's been a couple, couple reports like that coming out of Russia, hmm. and I don't know. Maybe some sometimes, like Dolly said, there there's a holog holographic imagery. Yeah, involved. 70 image that they're broadcasting. Yeah, if anybody knows about 70 technology, the the Chinese love it. They've got it on street corners. It looks like a giant animal's coming out at them, and everybody's you know, if you've seen it for the first time, you go, oh my god, you know, what is this? You can make you can have whales you know flying in the air around buildings that people have seen these movies they can make you believe anything with these things i seen and, those videos yeah they're pretty cool yeah, yeah. and, and I, for that matter when someone sees an et they don't necessarily perceive it correctly because your own right. belief system kicks in yeah and, uh, th that's i think screen memories kind of are connected to this Right. Um, you will see kind of what you expect to see, and people will walk away from the encounter thinking, "Well, that was an owl, right, or a deer." And I'm not yeah, sure because you, you try to rationalize it. You, what right. you saw, you, yeah. yeah. We, well, we have an inner dialogue. I mean, when we're having conversations with people and they're talking to us, we're still running a dialogue in our heads. And a lot of times, people don't understand what they're saying to them because they're overlaying it with what they're thinking. And your your ability to see, feel, and hear things is all in that. And if somebody's describing something to you or trying to show something to you, you could actually see something different than what they told you or showed you. It's a human thing. It's a trait that we have. And uh, it just depends on your state of mind when that happens. Yeah, well, that's why, Albert, your database is so important because I think now we have enough cases so that, yes, grays look like grays. This is a their true appearance. Nordics, do you get a lot of praying mantis type? Yeah, they're, 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 I, I, I do. Yeah, a lot of them claim that the praying mantis is that are the the head of the whole thing, or the top dogs, or the the, the boss. Right. Some of them no, it's not the mantis. Is is the uh, tall Nordics? Some of them no, it's the grays. Though you don't know. I think there's a confederation of uh, different races working together. Yeah, they, they don't really have a government. They all really do work together. They have consensus. Mm -hmm. People like to liken them to ant thinking, but it's not true. They're psychic. They hear each other think. They know the truth of one another, and they work together that way. And um, they don't. They don't. Uh, they don't have people who are authorities over anybody. They allow those with the most experience, the most knowledge, to help everybody decide what the consensus is and what they're going to do. And the experience always wins. You know, they what they're talking about. Well, here's another comment which. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I'm, I don't think this is about the recent case in Vegas, but 
it's related to that. David H. Altman is saying, has Albert ever heard of any eight to 10 foot tall humanoid cases in Vegas? <laughs> no, before you oh, answer. <laughs> only the one we just talked about earlier, <laughs> the one in, in yeah. this year, May, May uh, 1st, I think. Vegas. There are some reports of ETs being seen in places you would never expect, and I know that there's a number of in casinos, Cas casinos, yeah, <laughs> which um, gas stations. I mean, I've heard all over the place, but th th this brings to mind a question for me: is what's the tallest humanoid that you report you've collected? I think the tallest I ever got was a praying mantis, and I have two that the witnesses swear up and down they were 15 foot tall. One guy's a <laughs> He's a Navy medic. You know, I tried to talk him down a little bit because I'm like, listen, Kevin. Kevin was his name. That sounds a little tall to me. Are you sure? He says, listen, I'm six foot tall. And you know, I, I interviewed him face to face and several times. He's subject to one of my books. And he's like, it was easily twice as tall as me. I talked to another lady. She's nine foot tall. There was a teacher in Illinois. Um, who swears up and down the praying mantis she saw was 15 feet tall and she measured it against the uh, street light. She watched it walk by under it. So I'm wondering what's, you know, how tall do you think they I, get? I was just um, looking up some cases from Peru from an investigator uh, over there, Dr. Shoy, and he, he spoke about several cases of giants more than four meter tall, right. five meters. Uh, in in 2014, I got a, a report directly uh, from Spain from the uh, one of the witnesses. They encounter uh, this creature who looked like a huge robot, though. He was wearing some kind of uniform, uh, had metallic, but he was. They said it was at least eight meters tall. Now, what is eight meters in feet? Twenty-four. Uh, yeah. Three yeah. feet. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God! Two and a quarter, almost three feet. So, wow. so, and there's other other reports from uh, Russia in the 1990s, 90, 90 91. Yeah. It was a a huge wave back then over there, of uh, and uh, either even taller cyclo cyclopean uh, I can't humanoids. One twenty. I just can't even fathom twenty four foot tall. <laughs> I mean, there's giants on Earth. I think the evidence for giants on Earth back in historical times. Is pretty persuasive, but I don't even think they were that tall. The skeletons. No, they were it, if you got to imagine somebody that tall, I mean, the, their ship must be huge too. But <laughs> I, I don't know. So um, what about? I mean, on the opposite spectrum, because Dolly and I were talking about this. I think just today, miniature humanoids, and I know there was a huge spate of reports in Malaysia involving, you know. Less than and foot tall. For, for some reason, yeah, in Malaysia, there's been a lot of reports, uh, especially in the 70s and 80s, of what they call tiny humanoids. Maybe only about 10 inches tall or less. Yeah. Yeah. And some and uh, some of these humanoids were armed and they weren't uniforms and they were kind of aggressive. I'm going to send you the image. Okay. Uh, Preston of the Spanish case. Want me to send oh, it to right. you in a uh, Facebook directly, or yeah, you know, if you can send it on message Messenger, I, oh, I, Messenger, I, okay, I can pull it up from there. I'm gonna send it to you. It's interesting because there's a drawing of the entity and a tree. Let me find. Let mm. me find Facebook in a minute. Sometimes my, I, love you, Dolly and Preston. Thank you, Penny. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how tiny these things. I did a whole study on little tiny ETs. Uh, and there was one where a lady had a UFO fly into her bedroom and actually landed and tiny little ETs came out. And I kind of discarded it, but going through the literature, there's there's a number of them like this. Keel, Keel wrote about a case like that, a lady in New York, I think. Oh no, in Washington, Seattle, Washington. So I'm kind of, a craft went in and um, landed on the table and little people came out. Yeah. I had a, when I was on board once, um, <clears throat> they brought, uh, they brought in uh, five or six people, you know, for being checked out in, uh, one of them had people with them from ET side of it and they walked them through another door and I was watching cause this person seemed to be out of it. 
And uh, I had nothing better to do. And I'm curious as I'll get out. So I followed and I went into um, one corridor and I'm following him. And I went into this big room and uh, they laid him out on a table and a big glass shield came over him and it seemed to gas up. And I was leaning on the back wall and I was told I can stay there, but I can't react and I can't move from where I'm at. No getting close to it. Nothing. I'm like, okay, fine. I'm good. You know, and I'm watching this human shrink inside this glass capsule. And it took about three and a half hours. I was glued. I could not move. I was shocked. And it, he went from about a five and a half foot human being all the way down to less than 12 inches tall. And another door across the room opened up and these small beings came in the door and walked over. They dropped the table all the way to the floor. They helped him get up. They wrapped him and walked him back out through the door. Now, by this time, I'm all like my jaws on the floor. And I'm just like, I can't believe what I just saw. And the craft is an uh, entity. It's a live craft. Okay. And it can talk. And he... I'm like, what did I just witness? What is this? And he said, you know, there's a micro universe and a macro universe. And he said, there are beings who come up to ours and work with us and then go back down to theirs. And I said, how is this possible? And he said, it's an inner, it's an dimensional shifting thing that they do that helps them bring them back into their own size. And uh, I, I, it was beyond me at that age. I was a young woman. I was only in my twenties and I was in dead dead shot. And I still live with that for the rest of my life. I'm, I haven't seen it again, but I know it exists. And I know that there are beings who are less than 12 inches tall. And, and you, you were on board a UFO? When yeah. You uh, been abducted? Okay. No, no. I, I am a pilot. I pilot the craft. I was taught. Okay. You don't know I, about I'm my not, story. <laughs> you know, I, I read, I read the book Cemetery. Yeah. I do. Okay. okay and yeah, I, I I, there was the another book that it, that, that he mentioned you also, yeah, that, that you pilot a UFO or something like that. Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. Cause Dolly, I, I interviewed her about that. I asked, I was doing research into, you know, this sort of thing, the sizes of ETs and cause Betty Andreessen described that exact thing. She saw someone get shrunk down. They called it deopulating, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was interesting. But yeah, but yeah. so I'm going to bring up that picture you sent over via messenger. There it is. So that's the giant. Yeah, eight meter tall wow. creature, uh, Spain, 2014. That is off did the chart. You, what, did it just stand there the whole time, or? It, according to the witnesses, uh, after they ran up from it it kind of followed them for a while and then they, there was they were kind of, when they were running away they, they they hid like a like a what they say they felt like they were being encased in, in spider webs Ew. everything got and, and and after that the, the creature disappeared and the spider webs also so it was huh. something weird it's like something was preventing them to from running there's a lot of weird physical effects, isn't there? Land yeah, a lot, a lot. Landing traces is one thing, but people report just about everything under the sun. I mean, for that yeah. matter, under any sun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have another question from the chat room. This is from Christopher Harmon. And he says, I have a question for Albert. Do you think ETs can time travel? <laughs> of, of some of the cases that I know of and I read and I've been researching from other, I, I think, I believe so. I think there's a possibility that they could go to the future and to the past and they're yeah. able to do it. I, mean, I don't know well, about, about all of them, of them, but I think some of them are able to do it. Yeah, They, they certainly do give prophecies and tell they people do. things that will happen. I remember yeah. I was interviewing one lady and she was talking to the Mantids and they said, this is going to happen with your relationship. She didn't want to go into detail. It was very personal, but I hear that all the time. One other contactee real quick, Don Anderson is largely conscious like Dolly, not needing hypnotic regression has taken on board a craft, human looking ETs. This, he went with his little son and the ET told him what was going to happen in his future, that he was going to meet this lady, showed him a picture of her, and it turned out to happen under very fortuitous circumstances. She's from a foreign country. It was chances of it happening were almost yeah. nil, but it did. So they knew they could look into the future at the very least. 
I'm not sure if I call it time travel, but yeah. That, well, at least yeah, they do a lot of cases in the '90s or '80s, '70s. These ETs or whoever they might be, they they warned us about future climate disasters and climate change and uh, changes in the. Uh, that there will, you know, a lot of more earthquakes, volcano, and it's really happening. I think a yes, lot of it is. absolutely is beginning yeah. to occur. Right. Yeah. I I can personally yeah. tell you that time travel isn't what everybody thinks it is. When you when you leave this dimension, the third dimension, you go outside and you leave uh, space time. In other words, you're not marking time anymore. You're out there. Your consciousness is light and it can see everything past, present, and future. You can look at it like you're looking at a book or watching a movie. And what they what they're able to do is because they travel interdimensionally as they're outside of space time and they can see the future and they can see the past. They can interact um, only for, as an observer though. Uh, because what's for us in the hard core of it, our physical body couldn't take that kind of time travel. We have to go outside of this dimension to do it. And it's um, very precarious because you're not really in it. You're out of it just looking at it. And uh, that's how they see time. And uh, it, it's hard for people to conceptualize that. If we were to try to physically go back in time, there would be nothing there. Physically there, it's gone. And in the future, you run the risk of um, evaporating your own body because what it would take for you to get there would di disassemble everything you are. You're all, every molecule in your body would just evaporate and go away. So Okay, so you you would you agree that time is not linear? Then is like no, it is not. No, and we're we're our consciousness, who we really are, because we're just indwelling these bodies, is is capable of under and seeing all time at the same time. We're we're conscious of it in a, in another dimension, and we're we're here for a reason to learn, and we've encapsulated ourselves in this third dimensional three D body, and so it kind of cuts you off from seeing. Uh, outside of linear time, you know, time is time like, okay, first dimension is a straight line, you know, second dimension is a straight line and height. And everybody in the first and se second dimension can only see inward on themselves. They can't see outward. By the time you make it to the third dimension, you can understand because your consciousness is lightening up a little bit. There's less gravity than the first and second dimension. And your consciousness is able to make contact with your physical mind. And so you can conceive of understanding a fourth and a fifth and a sixth dimension. You know, you can almost draw it out on paper. Uh, that Because you understand it doesn't mean you can't get to it, but you can see out in your mind to do it. Everybody out, every dimension in, in front of us, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, they all can see in on us. It's always inward toward the bottom of it. And we're looking up from here. Once you leave here, all time ceases to exist linearly in a linear way because we're so gravity heavy here it slows us down and we we're we're ticking you know instead of all at once well, there are some people who put forth the theory that the grays are us from the future time traveling no, to the past and then i looked into it you know, yeah. there's a few cases you can march out to support any theory but yeah. I think yeah. 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 you know what i mean yeah. but that's again shoe picking and cherry fitting i think yeah. it's important yeah. that we look at all the evidence. And I'm going to back up here a little bit with a comment because we were talking about the Mothman, but this is from Jackie Violet. Question to Preston, Dolly, and Albert. Great show, by the way. Why is it when the Mothman is mentioned, there are also a UFO sightings? What was that about? And I think it's an interesting question because what I have found when I was investigating the Topanga Canyon wave is it wasn't just sightings. There was a cryptozoological sighting of this sort of ghost dog. There was a religious miracle event. There was a major haunting activity going on at the time. I'm wondering if somehow these are all related in a weird way. I think that's probably what's going on with the Mothman because there was UFO activity. There was a that, lot, yeah. A lot. That disaster with the bridge. I mean, there was a yeah. lot of paranormal. Men, uh, men in black reports and all that. I think there's there is a connection all the different type of phenomenon and i think there is a connection between mothman and ufos yeah definitely all right and here they were they were reported you know close to each other and there was actually a, re a report of a mothman going into a some kind of hovering red light type ufo oh, wow. according to, according to john keel he wrote about it all right 
this question is for Dolly, but I think it's something that we could all address perhaps a little bit. And it's from Don Curtis, who says, for Dolly, so with all the different types of ETs looking so different from one, one another, I don't think they're all that different, but okay, so different from one another, are they all from different planets? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> they are from different planets. They're from different uh, uh, solar systems in our galaxy and then outside of our galaxy as well. They, they're all over the universe. And uh, what we see coming toward us is generally from our galaxy. There are a few that are not. They're close, though. And um, the fact that there are so many artifacts left in the, the physical record on this planet that point, literally point to certain places like Orion and Zeta Reticuli. These are all in our galaxy, but they, they point to, you know, beings like us that live there. And they do travel interdimensionally to get to us. Yep. Interesting. So what do you think, Albert, of the fact that some of these ETs come down and don't need helmets and some have the classic fishbowl helmet? <laughs> and the, you know what I mean? Some of the early cases, like in the 50s and 60s, they, they reported ETs like they were connected to the, to the ship with a hose and some kind of breathing apparatus. But others, like you said, didn't appear to need that. Uh, and I don't know what to say about that. I think maybe some of them do come from a different type of environment from here, and they need help in breathing our, in our environment. Yeah. Other others others not. Maybe others come from places very similar to to yeah. ours. Well, there there is a, a pretty big variety of being seen, and I've often been contacted by people saying the reason I contacted you was because I wonder if you've seen this or heard a report of this type of humanoid. And here's a question from Donna's Happy Hour about this exactly. Has Albert had any other reports of green glowing creatures with orange triangular eyes and pointy ears? <laughs> I don't know if you'd yeah. answer, Albert. I have a, a database of 30,000 cases. <laughs> Probably I, one in there. Yeah, I know reports of green glowing creatures. I know reports of orange triangular eyes. And I had no I know of reported with creatures with pointed ears, but I don't know if there's a, a report of a creature with all those three things together. Uh, yeah. I do I cannot remember. I, it's not at the top of my head. <laughs> but you know they have they have creatures with uh, pointed ears, others with green, glowing green, and other maybe with triangular shaped eyes. Yeah, like a cat. Yeah. Well, there you go. It's the variation, but. Uh, like I've heard from many contactees and Dolly mentioned, we are all one. And that was something that I was really interested to talk to Dolly about because apparently that, like you said, Albert, the humanoid form does seem to be universal because I don't think we have any involving, you know, I, I, know, that are humanoid. I, I, I know reports of uh, creatures that appear to be, have you heard of that? Have you ever, uh, the report from uh, Wales, 1975, where the the uh, let me see, I was going to send you the image. The uh, the witness encountered a landed UFO with a transparent glass top, and inside there was a, a creature that looked like a blob of jelly, and it seemed to be moving around. Definitely hmm. not a not a humanoid, but uh, I'm going to send you the image. Light beam. To... They're probably perceiving a light beam. They're non corporeal, and they come in as light, pure light, and it you know. All energy doesn't stay, you know, in one place. It moves, it undulates, and does all that. So they they might have been the, superimposing two ideas that they had in their head, you know, because the movie The Blob, right? And then now right. they're seeing this light blob, and they're like, oh, "What is that?" So yeah, it's probably a light beam. I uh, also have reports of tentacle beings, different tentacles. I don't know, definitely not humanoid. Other reports of. Uh, just undefined beings like light, like like Dolly said, maybe just made out of light. Yeah. No, no form, maybe a, a sphere, but yeah. most 99% are humanoid form. All right. And what's your take on the ET agenda? Why do you think they're here? They've been here <laughs> forever. They've been here probably longer than we have. Uh, maybe they're supposed to, maybe there's something special about this planet they're supposed to watch or keep an eye or maybe just 
there's they're doing something here. I don't know what. But uh maybe this is like a Grand Central station where <laughs> everybody drops by before they go somewhere else. You know, different I, my personal theory is, is that it's just more common than we realize. And if you, once people reach that level of technology and are able to travel interstellar distances, why not? And it's clear to me there's multiple agendas. Some are just tourists, some are studying the life or looking at the various perhaps evolution and progression of a primitive species like us. Some are clearly here to help. I think there's a lot of healing cases, which you pointed several, and I found a lot in your yeah, humanoid yeah, days. Yeah. So you I, cover those a lot also. And um, yeah. Which I think is very encouraging. And uh, the fact that they have been here since, I mean, we know this from be before recorded history. I'm mm -hmm. not worried. I think, you know, they're not, I don't see this as a nefarious phenomenon in any way. So I'm not going to say everyone's encounter is all puppies. And I mean, a, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of people encounter after effects are bad for you. Some people even, even died after an encounter, but uh, there's a lot of cases in which Preston covered a lot of them in which they're here and they help people that either are terminally ill or. They're, they've I been mean, holding up the human race for a while now, especially lately. Any it, it, beings that are millions of years in advance of us, their wisdom, their moral amplitude, all of that is very, very well developed. They're, they're um, higher on the evolutionary uh, scale where knowledge and wisdom and how to use that. And the higher you go in your intelligence and your wisdom, the less likely, likely that you are going to have no empathy. You're going to have greater empathy. And the smarter you are, the more empathetic you are. And, uh, and beings, I was taught we're all related to one another. Okay. And there are places like us all over the universe and they were, they go and check up on us. It's like a thing that it's what they love to do. They want to see how we're evolving because we're all related. There are progenitors and uh, they give us pointers. They try to help us when they can, but it's still up to us. We are our own people. We're autonomous beings and we're all here together. And it's up to us as a one to elevate ourselves, you know, and uh, I think we see more of them now because literally Earth is failing at it. No, you know, offense to anyone, but we're not doing so good on the evolutionary uh, attainment. Well, you know, that's well, like I got your picture, picture uh, Albert. So yeah, I'm, that's I'm, from the one from the uh, Wales, UK. Yeah, for for those who can't see it, it shows a bluish sort of saucer-shaped object with a transparent dome in the. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they are kind of blobby looking inside. <laughs> Two kind of jelly type masses. Yeah. Yeah. It could be light beings. You know? Yeah. Well, there's absolute variation. And speaking of which, here is a question from the chat. We've got about 15 minutes left. So we're going to try and get through any other questions. But please forgive us if we don't make it. This one is from CT Guitar Guy 85. Mm -hmm. And it's, I have another question for Albert. Are you familiar with humanoid encounters with, quote, the grinning man? They have been seen with UFOs and independent of UFO sightings. I don't have any. Well, <laughs> I, I think this originated with the encounter with Woodrow Derenberger back in 1967. Uh, Ingrid Cole. Yeah, Ingrid Cole, Point Pleasant. According to him, Ingrid Cole was like, smiling or grinning at him. I don't know, but they kind of they kind of exaggerate that now. They show a guy with huge fa face with a huge teeth like grinning. I don't think it was like that at all, but there's been reports of a strange grinning uh, entities, mostly not associated with UFOs, but this uh, Ender Cole was definitely a uh, UFO if that's a demon. Some kind of weird demon coming after him. You know? Could be. Uh, I mean, I, I I honestly think that ETs, some of them do have a sense of humor and are just plain human. Others might have a sort of a, a fixed a mask or some sort, or putting forth something that's perhaps not what or people are perceiving not clearly. I think there's a lot of things going on here. They they kind of some some of them are the scenarios that you see or encounters are kind of like. They don't. They just don't make any sense. Right. I don't right. know. Well, 
Yeah. Here is another question. And this is from On Your Shore. How come we never seem to hear about the Arcturians? Can you say anything about them? You know, I get a lot of reports. People will ask, where are the ETs from? And they can be evasive. I don't think we necessarily know where a lot of these guys are from. Dolly certainly talks talks a lot about that in the book Symmetry. But yeah, Arcturians, I don't know. Well, you got reports of people that they told them, yeah, I'm from the planet, whatever, here and there. But some some of them don't don't give you you know don't give you the the star system just the name of a planet but uh and, and i can't really think of a case where in my database which uh i keep getting people you know, telling me that they're arcturians and they're from zeta reticuli which is kind of amazing to me because a lot of grays are from zeta reticuli it's in our galaxy and um i find that interesting you know hmm so well i don't know yeah, well, they come from all over the universe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of speculation that we originally came from Mars, and the fact that some of these guys look just like us, I think, does have serious implications about who we are, our relationship to them. Did we even evolve on this planet? I don't know if you ever heard of that book by Ellis Silver, Humans Are Not From Earth. He kind of puts forth an argument why we might not be well suited to this planet. It's interesting, to say the least. Yeah, we're uh, we're kind of uh, one of those one of the only species here in the planet that do not know how to share with other type of species. Well, other species are either mm -hmm. are yeah. We destroy a place and we will move on. Right. Destroy that place and then we we don't know how to adjust to nature around us. And that's mm -hmm. very important. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, here's another question, which I'm not sure I fully understand, but I'll. I give it a shot. It's from Giorgio Piacenza. He is also a friend, by the way, of Brazilio Sanchez Osejo. He says, are many contactees ET family? So I guess you are... Like a hybrid? Um, are they related to the ETs themselves? I we guess? all are. We all are. Every last one of us. Yep. I would say... No that kidding. That a fair we, state. We were put here. We did not evolve here. That is false information. We did not evolve on Earth. And we were put here. And yes, we're all related to them, all of us. Hmm. Okay. Here is another question then. And it's again, a little bit off topic, but we'd like our chat to be able to ask any questions. <laughs> Neural channel. He says, I love my Bob Lazar. What about Bob? <laughs> What's your take on? Bob Lazar. I think he had a. <laughs> I think he had a, a a lot of information that was proven true. I mean, true information, real information. Yeah. I don't think this guy was a disinformation agent. Uh, I know there's a lot of them out there, but I don't think Lazar was. I think he's a pretty genuine guy. Yeah, I agree. In fact, I would refer to. Don Anderson, a contactee I mentioned earlier, who said that when he was taken on board, the craft he saw was exactly like what Bob Lazar drew many years later. Right. So when he saw Bob Lazar's drawings, he's like, oh, I think he's for real. And let's face it, Bob Lazar was just the first of many people who started to say exactly what he's saying. Coming out now more and more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're getting closer to the end of the show. Um, so I want to make sure, Albert, that if we haven't touched any topic that you specifically wanted to cover, that you have a chance to do it. No, I'm here. I'm open here for questions and stuff. No, I, I think right. I think we we cover a lot today. That's my UFOs over Florida book. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely an excellent yeah. book that I would highly recommend. There is something about Florida that is particularly active. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Now, do you have a website where people can contact you? I I have my email. I'll I give it to you guys. I, I don't have. Okay. I used to have a website, but anymore. You can. They can contact me through my faith, Facebook page. You might okay. have another another encounters. Uh, here's my email. You guys could share it. Anybody wants to contact me, They're, they they feel free to do. Please. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay there we go. There it is. Oh, no, this is just another question. I'll pull that up if I can get it. Um, so this is a question from CT 
Guitar Guy 85. Do aliens often interrupt couples in intimate moments? LOL. I know David Jacobs reports on a case where the couple was in the middle of being intimate and in March the Greys right through the wall took them and put them back in position. <laughs> I don't know oh, that. And I, I know Keel mentioned several cases like that where to say there's a couple in a car being intimate park, you know, they used to people go in their car, whatever. And all of a sudden there's somebody bangs on the, on the, on the car window and it's a Bigfoot or some kind of other creature. And for some reason they are attracted to that energy that we release when we're, I think I heard of that before. Well, we're you're probably in the, broadcasting pretty loud. Yep. Well, yep. Yeah, well, I mean, if someone wants to get a hold of you, they can just go to your Facebook page, which also, we, yeah, yeah, which we yeah. do have on the show notes. Yeah. So. And after the show, we'll make sure that we put it down in the notes of the show that uh, what your yeah. your contact information is. Yeah. So this is just a comment from Rad Peanut, who says, "I personally believe Bob Lazar never seemed to gain anything from it, nor ever wanted to, and turns out a lot of what he said was true." Yeah. And I agree. And once again, people who step forward with these stories have not only a lot to not a lot to gain; they have a lot to lose. They do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, certainly, that was true in Bob Lazar's case. He was viciously attacked by debunkers. And whenever anyone, you know, when people start lining up to shoot you down, to me, that's a red flag that this is person is going on, right? touching some nerves. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah. Bob Lazar knows what he's talking about. I personally endorsed him to everybody. They should read his stuff. Okay. Here's another question, which is more on um, current events in the UFO field, not so much humanoids, but it's again from Rad Peanut. Thanks, Rad Peanut. I've personally been wondering a lot about Project Blue Beam. Is it just fear mongering rumors or is there any reason to be wary? Thanks. I don't know, Albert, if you want to comment on that or not, but there's a lot of buzz in this UFO field about a false flag and a fake. I, 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 I think it's, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, there, there's, there's a, they're capable possibly doing that kind of scenario. False, false information, holographic technology that, like Dolly said, but I don't know. If, I don't know if it's about Project Blue Bean happening now anytime soon. I, I, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think so. I have a question for you. You were in the Navy and you were a communicator, intelligence and that high. Did you, while you were at sea, did you guys ever see any triangular black net objects in uh, the sky? No, I was mostly out in the, in the, at sea in the 70s. There were, yeah. I remember there were reports of lights and stuff, but no triangular craft. Yeah. We found, one time we found floating in the ocean what appeared to have been a, a, a life uh crap one of those uh mm. lifeboats yeah with, with russian markings mm. and this was uh this was was in the atlantic and it was all ripped apart it was and then they, i remember they took it up to our location up in the radio room maybe i'm not supposed to talk about it now. but anyway <laughs> when, when we got we got we went to norfolk virginia and somebody went out to some people showed up and they took it up they took it away oh wow yeah I had an experience in 2014. Um, my cousin and I had gone to Sarasota to watch the fireworks. Well, actually, it was St. Petersburg. We were, and we were out on the beach after the fireworks on the 4th of July. We were out. You know how you run up the beach with your little nets and your flashlights and you go crabbing, you know, crab catching? And uh, we stopped. And I looked down south, you know, towards Sarasota Beach. And uh, we saw four, you know, of the fire golden craft coming toward the shoreline that way, huge. And they came in, they lowered, and then they suddenly jumped up and boom, they went back out, went straight out west. And then about three seconds later, we saw four more come down and and this went over and over and over. And I looked at my cousin and I said, what the hell? And she was like this, oh, she couldn't talk. She wouldn't talk to me. And I'm like, oh my God. Now in my mind, I'm like, who's out there okay i'm sending messages who's out there and one of them broke off and came right up the beach line at us i mean like that and hovered over me for a minute and all i could get from it is we're busy and it went back and uh you bet i was on the internet after that 
looking for reports from that. And I saw several and I tried to keep them, but they disappeared off my computer and now they're off the internet completely. And I don't know, you, you're in Miami. You may or may not have, it was 2014. 2014 in St. Petersburg? Is it? Yeah. Well, they were more down in St. Like Sarasota, getting Sarasota, close to yeah. Naples. Yeah. Okay. I have, I heard of incidents in that area, but I, that one specifically, I, I can't recall if I have heard it. No. Yeah. I Like I said, I saw four reports of it. Somebody got it on film from Sarasota and then put, it all disappeared. It's very frustrating when that happens on the internet. You know, it's like, oh my God, what are you, you know, what the hell? Happens and a lot. Kind of, you know, okay. something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're at that point where we really should be wrapping it up. I know there's a few more questions in chat, but we don't really have time to talk about Skinwalker, <laughs> which is a whole show on its own. And but they yeah, are, I mean, we'll they're definitely really blown it out of proportion, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But um, yeah, I really want to thank you, Albert, for coming on. Your books are amazing. Thank Here you. You're are. welcome. Yeah, yeah, it's been a true pleasure. Um, you're a true asset to the field and very much encourage people to check out your books thank um, you we will have your facebook information well you can anyone can look you up pretty easily on facebook yeah uh, just by typing and, in uh, and, and they can join the group and uh, they'll enjoy the group anyway yeah, uh, it's been my pleasure to be to have been here with you guys tonight nice thank meeting you dolly and press nice we got too. to talk yes. thank you thank you and, and what's the name of your facebook group again Humanoid and uh, humanoids and other strange encounters. Yeah, okay. I love that group. Okay. There's so many groups with just absolute. I'll, yes. I'll send. I'll send you a link on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. And I would also like to thank all our listeners that have been watching us or listening to us from the United Paranormal Radio Network and uh, the United Public Radio Network, coming to you from New Orleans at 107.7 FM and 105.3 FM. Uh, Thank you very much. It's been a joy tonight. Real joy. Thank you so much. All right. That's it tonight. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. Till next time. Thank you very Till much. Enjoy having you. Thank you, Albert. You're welcome. Bye. Okay, we're off, I think. Off. Nope, no, not I yet.